Hello, hello. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Professor Dev, Professor Patacharya, Professor Chattaraj, uh, my friends and colleagues and students, and everybody who has joined online. So at IACS, uh, as a part of the celebration of the uh, 75th Indian uh, uh, Freedom, that we have uh, organized a series of lectures and these webinars. And today, this second lecture will be delivered by uh, Professor B.M. Dev. So uh, I request my colleague, uh, Professor Shatraji Dodikari, uh, to conduct today's program. Professor Dodikari, please. So, good afternoon, everybody. And it's my great pleasure that I'll be conducting and I will be inviting the chairman of this session for an eminent quantum chemist like Professor B.M. Dev. When we are starting our PhD time, then we used to know that one of the grand, grand old quantum chemists and among them, one of them is Professor B.M. Dev. Uh, and to chair this session, uh, may I invite Professor S.P. Bhattacharya to introduce Professor B.M. Dev. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, uh, Professor Apur Chakraborty, Director ISCS, for uh, granting me the great pleasure and privilege of introducing Professor B.M. Dev to the audience of this webinar this evening. I had the opportunity to work with Vidya in different contexts, teaching in the post msc integrated MSPhD program of ISCS and SMBS National Center. Organizing meetings, I can mention that first TCS meeting in Tundiga, that Professor Dev was the organizer. We assisted as much as we could. Paper setting work and evaluation, of course, 
uh, relating to national level influence examinations and so on. <clears throat> on each occasion, I marveled at the extreme organizational ability, skill, and meticulous planning with an eye for every detail and imagination that they display. I learned something or the other on every such occasion. Professor Dev needs no introduction for the majority of the people in the audience, but for the younger people, I would uh, narrate his career trajectory. Professor Dev did his MSc in physical chemistry from uh, the university and joined ISES to work for his PhD degree with Professor Shantiran and Patel, following up to his trajectory, who was the head of the physical chemistry department. But a year later, he moved to the Institute of Mathematics, Oxford University, from where he obtained his diploma in advanced mathematics, and followed it up with a different degree in mathematics under the tutelage of Professor Charles Fulson. <clears throat> On returning to India in 1969, Vidya Nuda again joined ISS as CSIR tool officer, and then. Uh, about a year later, he moved to IIT Bombay for a brief period, moving out once again to DITS Pilani. After one year, he came back to IIT Bombay, where he set up his famous school in theory of theoretical chemistry. In 1984, he migrated to Punjab University in Chandigarh, where his school of theoretical chemistry flourished further. <clears throat> Professor Dev super animated in 2004 and came back to the city of joy once again and continued working in various capacities. Uh, first in the Center for Basic Sciences, Isaiah Kolkata, Vishwarthi University, uh, which granted him the status of scholar in residence. Professor Dev has, an extraordinary, has been an extraordinary teacher and a scientist of excellence. His practice took teaching and research, not merely as a profession, but as a deeper pursuit of life, blending passion and imagination, dedication and creative thinking. Naturally, he attracted bright young students from all over India, whom he mentored and helped grow in stature. I can see one of them in the audience, in Professor Patil Chattara, Adhimad Mughal Kapoor has joined online. They are very, very well known for their contributions. His emphasis throughout has been on building up understanding, concepts, just not merely getting numbers. His highly influential work titled The Post Concept in Chemistry and the Single Particle Density in Physics and Chemistry have motivated many young students of those days to take up theoretical chemistry as their pursuit. His work on the concept of spaces in molecule, quantum twin dynamical approach to chemistry and physics of collision systems, time dependent density functional theory, which is a pioneering work, response of atoms and molecules and super intense electric fields and magnetic fields, uh, reveal his breadth of understanding and depth of imagination. He has received numerous awards <coughs> and the partners of Prize. And he is a fellow of all the Indian Academy of Science, Indian Academies of Science, fellow of Bird World Academy, and I'm in military. Professor Dev has many, many of you may not know, Professor Dev has multidimensional cerebral existence, covering the entire spectrum of science, arts, literature, music, and culture. His book, published by Bishwamarit in 2055, entitled The Peacock in Slender, Science, Literature, and Art in Ancient and Medieval India, is an eloquent testimony to his intellectual multidimension. For quite some time, Professor Dev has been working on the ancient and medieval Indian contributions to mathematics. Professor Dev is a highly accomplished speaker. His articulation and 
logical exposition keeps the audience spellbound and enthralled. I have experienced many, on many occasions. I'm sure his lecture today, titled The Jewel of the Serpent, James says of mathematics in ancient and medieval India, 3000 BCP, 1600 AD, will be no ship exception, and we are sure we mean for the very rich here. With this, may I request Professor Liam Lee to deliver the lecture on the location of, uh, as a part of celebrations of Agari and Amrit Mahatma. Thank you, Professor Bhattacharya, for a very kind introduction. It's a great pleasure to deliver this lecture at IACS on the occasion of the 75th anniversary of Indian independence. And I am really grateful to Professor Tapos Chakraborty, Director of ISES, for giving me this opportunity. No, no, first one. I did it. Okay, you see, I'm going to get it. Okay, so the, the first line is missing, but that is the so that is the title. You see, I did not format it according to the original. This was the one. No, but the uh, bottom line is this one. No, 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 that's the wrong one. Is it? Other than that? So, so this lecture, as Professor Vatikari mentioned, most of the material in this lecture has been taken from the Peacock book. And I must acknowledge, because not many people know, that scholars from many countries have been fascinated with Indian culture and civilization. And they have devoted practically their entire lives to such studies. So let me begin by showing you a Gaussian. So the, the axis here is perceived knowledge about original contributions to human knowledge from ancient and medieval India. And the ordinance, sorry, sorry, the ordinate is the number of persons. Now on the right hand side, on the right hand side, the extreme, there is no yet. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, on the on the right is not that extreme. On the right hand side, you have people who strongly believe that um, all the contributions to human knowledge came from ancient and medieval India. On the left hand side, that is all the world actually India's original all human knowledge was actually generated by India as original work. On the left hand side, we have the other extreme in which there are people, many people in fact believe that India did no original work. All the work that we refer to being Indian are actually 
borrowed from Mesopotamia, including Babylon, Greece, and Egypt. In between the larger part are people who do not belong to either of these two, okay? but they would like to know because they, are, they also know that since India contributed zero to human civilization, which many people have said is the ultimate in intellectual achievement, India must have done some other thing. So what are the things that India contributed or India knew? And what are the things India did not know? This inquiry has to be unbiased without any attempt at either glorifying or vilifying Indian civilization. So let us see what some scholars have said. So Macintosh said all history points to India as the mother of science and art. This country was anciently so renowned for knowledge and wisdom that the philosophers of Greece did not disdain to travel by the for their influence. Later, I'll give you the name of these Greek philosophers. <coughs> Mark Twain said, India is the cradle of human race, the birthplace of human speech, the mother of history, the grandmother of religion, and great grandmother of tradition. But this is something that we, we need to know. Max Muller said, I picked up a small paragraph on his writing. In this study of the history of the human mind, in this study of ourselves, of our true selves, India occupies a place second to no other country. Whatever sphere of the human mind you may select for your special study, whether it be language or religion or mythology or philosophy, whether it be laws or customs, art or science, everywhere. You have to go to India, whether you like it or not, because some of the most valuable and most instructive materials in the history of man are treasured up in India and India only. Now, India was not only known for knowledge and wisdom, it was also called the land of new traditions. So, uh, throughout the ages, plunderers and barbarians descended in hordes upon India and took away India's wealth as much as they could. <coughs> but this is this is a plot of global contributions to world GDP. by major economies from 180 to 2008. The orange line is India's contribution and the red line is Chinese contribution. We see from this, can you see this picture from the back? It's not full screen. The, the beauty of the pictures will not come only to this place. That's okay, that's okay. So now you can see if we go to the from orange, sorry, 1 AD to roughly 1700 AD, we see almost 50% of world GDP came from India and China. And from this, and sometimes India contributed 30%, actually, more than 30%. So from this, India was converted to a bigger country. How? That is, that we know. I'm not going to dwell on this. Well, this is the, this is the cover of the book. These are the chapters. I only, I would only point to two words here, two or three words. First, Indian religion. No other thing civilization in the world, as far as I know, said everything in the universe is connected to your dependence. That is holism. You cannot, for example, you cannot discuss chemistry without talking about physics, or mathematics, or biology, or other things. There are many other things. So 
ancient Indians made this explicit statement. The, if you go down to the bottom, then there is the two words remaining missing. So there is also no civilization in which women occurred to about 5,000 years. Not only physically, but the concept of them. Now, how were mathematicians regarded in the ancient world? So this I learned from Charles Kutum, the man from Convention. Charles Kutum was a, a very devoted Christian, enlightened Christian, and he, he was a teacher. Every, every week he would preach in the university church on Sunday, and I was invited to a few of them. I did not attend any of them. But he knew, but he did not say anything to me. And Charles Kutum, when he was president of the British Mathematical Society, in a presidential address, he quoted a part of this. I thought it cannot be the complete quote, but Dr. Kutum had said. So I hunted it out. The good Christians should be aware of mathematicians. And all those who make empty, empty professes. The danger already exists that the mathematicians have made a covenant with the devil to darken the spirit and to confine man to the bounds of hell. So even with the full weapons, anybody can find it. What was the situation in India? In India, mathematics and practitioners of mathematics, mathematicians themselves, were held in very high esteem. And mathematics actually penetrated all aspects of human life in ancient and medieval In Vedanga Jyotisha, we have this, like the rest of the peacock. There is a book in, on Indian mathematics titled The Crest of the Peacock. So I do not choose that. So, and the jewel of the serpent. Mathematics stands at the head of all sciences. In, in the world of modern sciences, we see a clear reflection of this. So mathematics is at the top, which is not seen here because it is hidden. In physics, there is technology, everything, including applied sciences, emergence, emerging technologies, uh, including quantum computing, new drugs and delivery systems, new catalysts, etc., etc. So all emerging technologies are found in this. And everything in this frame is connected to everything else. Now, this is the network of interconnectivity between modern sciences, social sciences, and finance. What are the foundations of mathematics in ancient and medieval India? Numbers, algebra, and geometry, as well as their interconnectivity, form the foundations. <coughs> Excuse me. From the foundations of ancient and medieval India, mathematics. <laughs> as they have been for modern mathematics. These are the foundations of modern mathematics as well. Indians were exceptionally adept in numbers. The last inheritor of this grand tradition was Srinivasa Ramanujan. Geometry provided the common cognitive feature in the human brain. And therefore, this linked major civilizations across the world. It was not only the Greeks who highlighted geometry. For example, Plato, the great Greek philosopher, had designed a temple. I found it here. He put an inscription on the, on the door of the temple. Let no one who is ignorant of geometry enter here. So geometry was considered very important. For example, an ancient rock painting of India has the same geometric pattern as a rock painting in Bolivia, which is younger by thousands of years and separated by nearly 10,000 kilometers. But nobody should make the mistake of uh, thinking that 
and originally copied from them. These are mistakes which a number of so called historians have made, innumerable such mistakes. So, should that be? On the left hand side, Now, why did mathematics begin in India? Now, our source of information is not much good. So, my book, for example, does not discuss spirituality or astrology or anything else like that. So, source of information are manuscripts and archaeological information. These are the two main sources. And therefore, these are backed by scientific studies. Under no circumstance, if a scientist inquires into his or her past, he or she cannot sacrifice scientific attitude. If you do, then as a scientist, one is not take the study seriously. Based on recorded history, you can go back to the unique Indus Valley civilization. There is no time to tell you why Indus Valley civilization was unique. There are a lot of people that said this is borrowed from the Sepatia, which is not correct. It seems fairly certain to have the vegan hardy. <clears throat> if in the timeline over hundreds of centuries you see a sudden spike, let's say that is in the very civilization, an extraordinary civilization, 3300 BC to 1900 BC. But the spike cannot be done just like that. It's not a delta function. So before that, there must have been. Many many centuries have been lacking. We know nothing about that. Except aspects of geometry. So I'm making some bold statements. Except aspects of geometry and certain astronomical instruments, ancient and medieval Indian mathematics were more advanced than those of the Greeks. In particular, in number, algebra. Concepts of infinity and infinitesimal foundation to calculus, etc. We'll soon see this. Unfortunately, in a travesty of truth, the origin of almost every major mathematical development has been ascribed to European and Arab rather than Indian sources. Interestingly, the Arab scholars by and large themselves did acknowledge their origin Indian sources. In Arabic language, <coughs> a mathematician used to be called Insa, meaning from India. IVC had a, a, a number of words with uh, polished and blunted edges, and they were in fractions of 1 upon 20. Sorry, I have not read from it. 1 upon, let's say 1 upon 10. 1 upon 20, etc., etc., and integers of 1, 2, 5, 10, 30, 50, 100, 200, and 500. Notice the position 0. This is IGC. Many of the words have definite shapes, such as the geometry, keywords, barrels, cones, etc., etc. And uh, for example, you see on the right hand side, upper row. There is a preferred not, not. So this is the first example of topology that we see. And there are ways I don't dwell upon them, except to point out the rectangular grid. This was a specialty of English medicine. We will talk more about that. And also notice the plus sign. The hospital was built around the plus sign. So this is artist's impression of Mohenjo-daro in this very civilization. This is unique rectangular grid structure, which penetrated deep into the Indian psyche 
over a millennium and also adopted by city planners all over the world. The claim that industrial civilization destroyed the variant innovation team do not accept it. No scientific study would support it. And uh, I haven't shown that. Uh, 800 AD, there was a large temple complex in southern India called the Vaishnava Temple in Sri Ranga Patna. If you see the layout, looks almost like this. Nearly 4,000 years, considered by thousands of years. Which shows that, as I said, it had gone deep into our sun. We thought of greed. And making such a rectangular, huge rectangular place accurately cannot be done with those Pythagoras theorem. And therefore, Pythagoras' theorem, which then started and was known in India, Egypt, and China before Pythagoras, come to their very period. And we come to full verse of 800 to 500 BC. Although they are the oldest mathematical texts in the world, they are not formal mathematical systems. They are appendices to the Vedic scriptural texts known as Shroka Sutras and explain the construction of square, rectangle, parallel graph. <coughs> Trapezia, etc., involving the theorems reasonably needed for the construction of religious altar. This was their only purpose. The geometry of the altar, depending upon the specific purpose for which a ritual is conducted. These materials, by and large, covered the first two books and the sixth book of Euclid, the magnificent treatise on geometry, called Elements. Elements was completely lost, and 800 years later was rewritten. Question is, you say if it was lost, how did we rewrite it? Why did we get? If somebody is still more skeptical, you ask, did somebody named Euclid really exist? These questions are unanswered. Just as it is recent to ask, did somebody named Homer exist? Did he actually fight Iliad and Odyssey? Now it is established there was nobody called Homer. In the period in which Iliad and Odyssey had been claimed to have been written, there was no writing tradition. Anyway, I won't dwell on that. This is very recent. This is not in my book, but it's outside of it. So these, uh, these materials by and large cover the first. Okay. Now, Urba Sikha actually contains the Pythagoras theorem before Pythagoras. The theorem in this form, the diagonal of a rectangle gives an area equal to the sum of the area given by length and breadth. The Shurva Sutras have been dated before Pythagoras. So again, European historians have said that uh, Pythagoras' first statement of the theorem and his subsequent proof of the invention of the invention Now, Shulva Sutra estimated pi 33.125. To follow the history of mathematics all over the world, it is very interesting to follow the history of pi. And expectedly, the most accurate values of the history throughout the ages came from it. This is one of the Shulva Sutras. Bodhana Sutra, there is a construction of Gorodo Chano altar. Required parameters are five layers of bricks. Each layer contains 200 bricks. 
of the total area of seven and a half square Purusha. Now, Purusha, the man, was the unit of length. This was mentioned in Rigveda. So, it was square bricks of four different sizes. So, anyway, bricks have been given, the areas have been given, and the number of bricks in each layer has been given. And if you employ this, you get two linear indeterminate equation. How are you going to solve this? Can you solve this by using present day mathematics? No. There are eight unknowns here. Linear indeterminate, and both are in a super solution was this. I myself checked the solution, this is correct. But how did they get it? What was the method? No information. So, for a scientist who is inquiring into this, it is extremely exasperating to decide this is the result. You take it, you believe it. You the poor guy would ask, what is the method? And this is accurate. Okay. So these are the possibly earliest indeterminate equations, originally from India, but now named after Diophantus, the great mathematician. Hundreds of years later. These are the only examples. I will give you another example. In which India's original work was renamed after Sanghana. In the present day, you would call it a year. Present. And this is a serious offense. This, this uh, I mentioned about the Garuda China, that is an altar in the shape of Vishnu's Bahama. The first layer of the Bakra Paksha Shema has a falconate bentings altar in Kosambi near Halawa, the second century BC. The wings consist of 60 bricks of type A, still there. Whereas the head, body, and tail are made from 50 bricks of type B, 6 of type C, 24 of type J. If you look at the tail or any other part in the body, you will see a plethora of right and left hand. You cannot see this without something like this. Here. Now, just as an aside, this, this altar near Milano was discovered by a trial of uh, people whom we highly respect. One is uh, M. Mutsaha, another is the Marxist mathematician and historian D. D. Kosambi, and a third is the Sanskrit scholar Patrish Chongjong Kubanta. I mentioned his name because two years ago I was asked by the Hilara TV to deliver the memorial lecture. In in the order to present the second so It was a pleasure to do this. These three are great friends, great discoveries. In the successive augmentation of the falcon shaped altar, not only is the theorem of Pythagoras used, but we know in all likelihood the motive of his invention. So without saying so explicitly, Adenberg is saying. Pythagoras theorem is the Indian invention. Now we are not so sure. As I said, Egypt and China also know that invention. Consider now, I am going to show you, I will come to some actual mathematics because the whole lecture is just to bring you a flavor. Those who are interested in details, you can look at the book. ICS library, I have been told, has a copy of the book. So, I won't go into detail, but just to tell you what probably the students will never show. Consider the most sacred guide to You will say, what, what is religion? As I told you, mathematics 
implicated every aspect of life in ancient and medieval Now, what is the guide to act? Dietary monitor is in Rig Veda, in BC, the world's oldest Muslim knowledge and religious text. The essential message of the Dietary monitor is life from life. Forget about the whole religious institution. Dietary Veda, Dietary was daughter of Muhammad. I don't know where it came from. She has four hands, etc., etc. Forget about all this. Essential message is absolutely fantastic. For an individual, why would you utter that one thing in the morning or even in the midday in front of the sun? He says, light from light, splendor from splendor for an individual, union with the source of light to acquire a luminous identity. Because only then can you try to make another person luminous. The mantra derives its name from the sacred Gayatri meter, a meter of 24 syllables. So, why do I have 24 syllables? Because it's sacred. Excuse me. Clearly, this is why Gayatri meter was sacred. Now, I don't know, but I offer you a conjecture. Based on the religious and mystical significance attached to numbers and sets by the ancient India, especially the prime number, note that 24 can be made into 20, but 20 are the simplest prime numbers. Magic numbers such as 64 and 108 were also considered sacred and occurred in a number of contexts. For example, women were required to master 64 hours. Not men, because uh, because described by uh, Vatsana in his Kama Sutra, he obviously did not have much. So he did not say men should also learn. But women should learn. <coughs> I must tell you, Vatsana never said this, but those women who learned 60, master 64 hours. They became very unhappy in their personal life. If you acquire such excellence, which keeps you apart from everybody else, you cannot be happy in life. Okay? So, this is very, very good. There are a lot of women in antiquity. In fact, uh, Dr. Rote's wives were said to have mastered this, particularly. Okay. And do you know how Koikei became a leader? <coughs> so my group has a list of 64 hours. Where did I get it? I got it from a family of Prasuna Tamila and Haikya. He said this is in Vatsana's Constitution. I was highly angry. So Acharya Dev was reading everything, <coughs> including Kama Sutra. So I hunted it out because I have both the English translation and English translation. Here it is there. So I put this in the book. So Yajna Valka's mathematical and astronomical descriptions in the treatise, this is a Vedic <coughs> treatise, Shatapata Brahmana. Incidentally, this has nothing to do with the Brahmana community. Brahmanas knowledge about them says that the distances of the moon and the sun from the earth are 108 times the diameter of the heavenly body. What is this? How did you get it? You don't know. Is this correct? Well, the modern scientific values are this. You do not see much at all. Additionally, the numbers 18, 36 occur again and again throughout antiquity. As for example, in the great epic, the Ramayana and Mahabharata. For example, 36 was used in the time cycles of many events. As for example, in the Vedic eclipse cycle, and in the event described in the Mahabharata. 
the geography of Mithra in Sanskrit at 36 minutes. The Mahabharata has 18 forward. The Bhagavad Gita in Mahabharata has 18 chapters. 18 option is perished in the collection of Mahabharata, lasting for 18 days. All of you might have read Mahabharata in <coughs> some form or the other. You may not have noticed this 18 occurring all through. What is this? Why? There are 18 Puranas and so on. The Ramayana has seven countries and the prime number. Why not six? In fact, <coughs> it is fairly certain now that the original Ramayana had only five countries present from second to sixth. The first Kandu was a later edition, edition and the seventh Kandu was still later by edition. So, no epic anywhere was written by a single person. <coughs> During Buddha's enlightenment, the beautiful daughters of Mara, this I'm taking from Ajita, yes, tried unsuccessfully to entice Buddha with 32 types of feminine. Again, a multiple of two. There are also 32 attributes of a great man like Buddha. In modern science, see the connection. Several other examples of such magic numbers arising from simple prime numbers can be seen at a shell structure where you see this one. Nuclear shell structure where again closed shells of nucleus are in nucleons are indicated by these numbers. Plethora of times. Six different types of quark in particle physics, in which the standard model regards quarks and electrons as the building blocks of matter with six flavors called up, down, charm, strain, top, bottom. Each of the six flavors has three different colors of quantum numbers. Such terminology in modern physics no longer appears somewhat mystical. I mean, it seems more in line to ancient language. In fact, the term work came from the writings of James. Okay. okay, the Eightfold Way, which is a way of uh, organizing subatomic variants and measurements into objects, both fivefold and eightfold symmetry occur extensively. In the plant and animal kingdom, for example, this huge hibiscus flower, diameter 10 to 11, fivefold symmetry, and this is eightfold symmetry of a circuit. But this fivefold or eightfold symmetry cannot be represented as far geometry of systems because they cannot be translated in the Euclidean space. Note also there are six rasas in Ayurveda, as well as six links of painting and six links of dancing in Kamasutra Vakshana. The list can be considered further. <coughs> For nearly 4,000 years, numbers such, such as one, that is the absolute, two, that is duality, all these penetrate throughout Indian culture. Three, the Trinity, five, five elements, seven, seven subjects, and their combinations have been deeply embedded in Indian symbols. I mentioned about the feminine mystic and said that both Buddhism and, and feminine mystic one has to know this in order to understand aspects of Indian culture. Uh, <coughs> one, the absolute in Indian culture and so especially Hinduism and Buddhism. This is represented by a one. The absolute in Indian culture and civilization is a woman. This is uh, from Vyodharana Kavit Nishada associated with Shukla Jadu. That is, this is actually background to appreciating Indian culture. That is fullness, 
This is so. In Elabath, when I was looking, when I mentioned this, I found the lady sitting, similar person, sitting in the fourth row, muttering something in Sanskrit. And I realized she is repeating this in Sanskrit because she is a senior person of Sanskrit in the community. I was very good. That is Sumnes, this is Sumnes. From Sumnes comes Sumnes. From Sumnes is, is taken from Sumnes. Sumnes remains. To me, this appears to be a concept of infinity. Implying infinity non is infinity. Is infinity. As is accepted in modern language. A common source uh, <coughs> or a common source of uh, both Greek and Vedic mathematics is to be sought either in the Vedic mathematics or in modern mathematics, very much like it. Thus, what are regarded as the two main sources of Western mathematics, namely Pythagorean mathematics and old Babylonian mathematics, <coughs> both flow from a still older source. What was this older common source like? I think its mathematics was very much like what you see in the Vedic Shulva systems. I don't know. <coughs> we are talking about here Shatapatha uh, Brahma. The average length of the solar tropical year is 365.2467 days. This is the value that the Ajna Valkyrie gave. It is only 6 minutes. 900 to 700 BC. This is only six minutes longer <coughs> than the modern value of this. This estimate for the length of the tropical year remains the most accurate anywhere in the world for over a thousand years. We now come to one of the greatest months of human civilization. I would put Panini on the same rank, certainly not below them, with Newton and Einstein. He is not appreciated. Panini has been appreciated when they have been acquired by Sanskrit and the Sanskrit experts. <coughs> At the beginning, as a result, we have not understood Panini at all. What did he do? Earliest comprehensive and scientific theory of politics, theology, and Morton. <coughs> 3,959 views of Sanskrit morphology. I think we let it in there. Let it in there. Let it in there. <clears throat> 3959 rules of Sanskrit mor morphology. Sentences, compound nouns, etc., are constructed by ordered rules operating on underlying structure, like operators operating on functions. Earliest use of a null operator and of a Boolean type logic. Earliest use of meta rules, which are needed for text mark mining, necessary for information processing. Panini's grammar was responsible for the transition from Vedic language to the mathematically constructed <coughs> Sanskrit language. Sanskrit means defined the culture. Language <coughs> of great power 
precision and, and medicism, I consider Sanskrit the best language in the world even now, essentially because this is the only mathematically constructed language. A hidden power of Panini Sanskrit language was revealed by Aryabhata in coding numbers. For example, this 4320000 can be coded in only two letters. While 15822375000 requires only five letters. This was pointed out by Amartya Dutta from Indian Statistical Institute who had come here to deliver a lecture on, on uh, ancient Indian language. <coughs> it has been argued by several workers that a number of contemporary developments in formal logic, linguistics, and computer science are essentially rediscovering the works of ancient masters such as Panini. Since Panini is the original inventor of what is known as the Bakasnava DM, Bakasnava form of contest-free programming language, it was suggested in 1967 by Inderman incidentally <clears throat> to write such things. You obviously realize that I have to read all these things. So the book is up to date with, as far as published books and research papers are concerned, up to December 2019. So it was suggested in 1961 by Ingerman that the DN form students can be called the Panini Backus form. Almost the entire mathematics in ancient and medieval India was written in Sanskrit verse form like tiger's claws enveloped in their velvet sheet is unique in Indian civilization. But there is a serious problem. This mathematics in verse form raises the question of proofs of the regular theory. You cannot write proofs as poetry. Proofs could not be written in verse form, but are given as Yuktis and Upapattis in the prose commentary by some of the masters themselves, <coughs> as well as their disciples. Such proof followed the detailed prescriptions laid down by Indian philosophical and logical systems. From 600 BC onwards, they naturally do not correspond to the logical axiomatic approach followed by the Greeks and Venetians. This logical axiomatic approach is the modern mathematical approach, and it came from this. Indians did not follow this. They had their own methods of proofs. The most detailed proofs of some important results in mathematics and astronomy were given in Malayalam prose by the Kerala mathematician Krishnadeva. In the year, I find almost all the Kerala mathematicians were centurions. You would not find with the head below 100 years old. <coughs> His book, Gonita Yukti Basha, or Yukti Basha for short, has been regarded by some as the first calculus text. In continuation of preceding preceding Indian mathematics, the Kerala School of Mathematics had laid down the foundations of calculus in 14th century AD. Okay. Singhala Chanda Sutra. Singhala was a, was a Jain ascetic. <coughs> so he formed the treatise on, gave a treatise on music, particularly the Rhythm from the matrix, which he called the survey for musical purposes. And the elements of the matrix can be reduced, increased to vary the rhythm, emphasize some rhythm or the other. 
he invented the binary number system. Actually, he created magic with zero and one. The concept of a binary code seems to be not so. Look at the year 400 to 200 BC. First use of the Fibonacci sequence. Most of you would know Fibonacci sequence. This is the sequence in which every number is the sum of two preceding numbers. Creation of Meru Pascal, Pascal's channel, which is needed in a number of contexts, especially spin couplings, electron spin couplings, nuclear spin couplings. Let us hear what Tagore says. Those of you uh, who may like to go back, this quotation by this comment by Tagore appeared in the second issue of Sankhya Journal, founded by Prashant Mahanandish. They were very close, Tagore and Mahanandish, and also Rani Mahanandish. And he persuaded Tagore to write on mathematics. Tagore protested, but the Congress extracted this from him. It's a beautiful thing. The enchantment of rhythm, uh, I, I cannot read that. The rhythm which is inherent in the notes and their grouping, it is the magic of mathematics. This rhythm which is in the heart of all creation, which moves in the atom and in its different measures, fashions gold and lead, the rose and the corn, the sun and the planets, the variety and vicissitude of man's history. These are the dust steps of number in the arena of time and space. What I know as intellectual truth is also not a perfect, is that not also a perfect rhythm of the a relationship of facts that produce a sense of convincingness to a person who somehow feels that he knows the truth. So believe any fact to be true because of a harmony, a rhythm in reason, the process of which is analyzable by the logic of the head. This is Pascal's standard. Every row is a binomial theorem. Manifestation of the binary. The sum of numbers of the diagonal, which I've shown here, from the Fibonacci series. I think I, the, the cellular automaton of Stephen Wolfram, his first paper on this appeared in the same year in the uh, reviews of modern physics, we published my article on the fourth concept. So this is a path-breaking paper. You know him as the originator of mathematics. The triangular blank spaces indicate sets of zero. Non-blank spaces indicate one. That this pattern is a fractal can be seen by examining smaller and smaller triangles which look like the larger triangles. This is a complex model of a computer model of a complex value. <clears throat> what Wolfram taught us is that incredibly complex systems can be generated by very simple mathematical means. A, a subject known as Vikalpa or combinator was known in India but not elsewhere. For example, Shushruta, the great surgeon and world's first plastic surgeon about 1000 BC, has said that 63 combinations can be made of six different rasas by taking them one at a time. He did not show how. We now know how. This is the this is a one row in the in Hindu pascals. The sum gives you sixty-three, and the gainers gainers uh, gainers give 
with this formula. It was also natural that such formula would lead to the medium system because singular was a gain of Lagrange. Now, quickly I go to this quickly. The size of the army in the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. Ramayana's army defines imagination. You notice 10 to the power 62 plus 5. Can somebody tell me among the young people what is this plus 5? No, this is Vibhishana and his four ministers who defected from Lanka and joined Sri Lanka. And this guy was so precise, he said plus five. Right? So don't take my calculations lightly. So when I gave this number to my students at either Kolkata, well, the students being very bright students, they had protested. So, sir, what is this? I said, what is the problem? So, how can this be true? I said, who said this is true? Why are you taking this to be true? I said, how can the number of soldiers be less than 62? I said, I can give them expansion. Don't uh, calculate only uh, the, uh, the monkeys, bears, and other animals, or some humans also. Calculate all the insects. Ants, etc. All animals, all insects. So I don't know. You might be twenty six four. Ravana's army. You see, poor Ravana. He had no chance before the Ravana's army. I felt sympathetic when I saw this number. This is totally unfair. Kaurava's army eleven Akshayani, Pandava seven. Pandava, there was. Let me tell you. The three king Mahabharata was enormous. There was no way Pandavas could win against Kauravas. Absolutely no way. Because man to man, including Vishnu, man to man, warriors on the Kaurava side were better than those on the Pandava side. Pandava side had Krishna. Which can send out everything. Now I give you the what was the composition this is in Mahavar. So these are the numbers. In fact, if you multiply 21,870 by 3, you get the number of horses, cavalry, and if you multiply 21,870 by 5, you get the number of infantry men in it. Option. Incidentally, I found that there are many two numbers. For example, this Ramadan was calculated by the Ravana spy. So this was prevalent in Lanka. When Sita was having a long discussion with Hanuman, and Hanuman wanted to take Sita on his back straight away to Ram, Sita said, No, being the warrior's wife, she would like her husband. To conquer Ravana and then he explained. That's fine. That this is in Ravana. So Sita was talking to Hanuman about how many divisions they should come with. Each division was an Akshayana. So Sita knew about Akshayanas. Anyway, numerous based on this. Uh, so this is okay. Zero and the decimal system are already present in the Indus Valley civilization, as we say. So, very important question. When, where, and by whom was zero discovered? Mm -hmm. But that it was in India, that you know. Now, the Greek system of nuance and the Greek method of representing numbers by, because Greeks knew geometry very well. A geometric segment had hampered the development of mathematics in the world. Buddhists and Jainists played with very large numbers and very small numbers. That's as far as all the frame Buddhist Mahajan text, Lalita Vistara, said that King Siddhartha gave the diameter of Paramanu as this. 
Assuming one has the 24 or 24 angular, the 18 meters. And this can be compared with the diameter of the innermost bore or bit of the Arduino. Incidentally, this is this conversion factor is understood by you. Is there no better conversion factor? I don't know. There is no single unique conversion factor. Whatever conversion factor you get, you land into some kind of absurdity of the art. So it was supposed to Why? Because all translators of Indian mathematics have taken hosto to be cubic. They have translated hosto as cubic, literal translation. And two cubits make a year. So one hosto is a cubit. This is as good as it, but it is not sufficient. There is <coughs> no better conversion factor than this. My book will give you a number of conversions. Again, contrary to what is taught to generations of our students, the Vaishnavic atomistic philosophy was propounded in India around 600 BC by Konami et al. and lasted for 2,200 years. This was more sophisticated than the Greek atomistic philosophy, which came later and lasted barely 200 years. And chemistry and physics today learn to do less sophisticated Greek description rather than the Indian sophisticated one. Now, Greek philosophers, Pythagoras, Halley, Anaxagoras, Empedocles, Democritus, Paracelsus et al. are said to have visited India, known to be the country richest in knowledge and wisdom to study Indian medicine. This is from Greek history. So, your Siddhanta trigonometry, I think I'll skip this because I'm running out of time. Except that you are there. So, this is about trigonometry, Indian trigonometry. You are Ja and Koja eventually become become sign and cosine respectively after a mistranslation. Ja was translated by Alex as Jeep, confused with Jai, which means heart, bosom, pole, day, car, translated in Latin as signer. Heart, bosom, pole, day, car, finally translated in English. Now we come to audio. I will go to Aryabhata, Brahmagupta, and Bhaskara too. There are many others. So now we have come to the golden age of Indian math. Okay. There are other famous mathematicians. I mentioned them in my book, but uh, and their work as far as I could. Aryabhatiya, a major work in mathematics from India, contained only 121 couplets in Sanskrit. Not more than 10 printed pages in a book of two days. Incidentally, have you ever, young people, have you ever thought <coughs> how did these people do in the mathematics? You need a lot of rough work to do mathematics before you reach the final result. There is no paper, no ink either. What did they do? <coughs> What did the Greeks do? Greeks had a beautiful writing medium, the sand on the seashore. Indians did not have this. So mathematics largely developed on the uh, river banks, for the Ganges in the north, and Nila River in the south. Kerala mathematics does not do. But the mark is not as good a writing medium as sand. Yet the ancient Indians, ancient Indians did that. Not more than 10 printed pages. Now, 
there are a lot of diehard believers who say that much before 1000 years before Copernicus, Aryabhatta proposed the heliocentric solar system. That is, planets move around the sun, not sun moving around the around us, as propagated by the by Catholic Rome. If you say the reverse, this is heresy, and therefore Giordano Bruno was burnt at stake. Galileo would also have been burnt at stake, but he had learned his lesson. He said, no, no, everything that I have said, I have written, they are all wrong. So he was in prison. But in the prison, he kept on writing in the books and he kept on smuggling these out to his disciples. This could show. So we don't know that whether there is no explicit mention of this in Aryabhutiya, but historians feel it is a strong indication of this in his calculation of planetary period. So he gave this period of rotation of the earth. Very precise. Concept of infinite astronomy to express the mere instantaneous motion, which he called Tatkal Tagoti. That reminds you of Tatkal tickets. Okay. So maybe it's the copies. <laughs> Add 14 multiplied for 4200 multiplied by your etc. etc. to get approximately the circumference of a circle. Diameter is 22,000 plus 5, which will be 3.1416. This is in the in the foyer of the main auditorium of science technology. Ariyamata seems to have used perimeter C minus C plus of the inscribed and circumscribed regular polygon of 384 sides for the unit circle. <coughs> In a certain way, you take diameter to unity. So unity can be 10 miles, 100 miles. Okay, so you can have more sites of the polygon. <coughs> Archimedes used a 96 sided site. Indeterminate equation, the Fantine equation. Okay. Now, now let me tell you the most famous work on. In figure and general solution of the indeterminate linear equation x plus c equal to by, you cannot solve this by a modern method, right? <coughs> the method which he gave is known as Kutaka. Kutaka means the pulverize. Keep on pulverizing, pulverizing, you will get this one. Okay, pulverize what? So let us take the equation. 137x plus 10 equal to 60y. Divide 137 by 60. Keep on dividing. Okay. So the quotients were notice 2, 3, 1, 1. Okay. Now the number of quotients excluding the first one is 3. Here we choose a multiplier such that on multiplication by the last residue, which is 1, and subtracting 10, the constant in the equation from the product, the result is divisible by the 10 ultimate remainder, that is 8. Thus, we have 1 multiplied by 18 equal to, sorry, 1 multiplied by 18 minus 10 equal to 8 times 1. So the multiplier is 18. Now from the following table, the quotients come first, 2, 3, 1, 1. Then the multiplier and the quotient of 10 is 1. Now create the next columns. Take 2, 3, 1 from the previous column. Multiply 18 by the number above 18 and add the quotient. So this become 19. So put that and keep 18 there. Next column, you keep 2 and 3. 
multiply 19 with the number above and add 18 till to 37. Keep like this. Next column, you see how the pulverizing, pulverizing is going on. Next column, multiply 2. Okay. By, oh, sorry, keep 2. Multiply 37 by the number above. That is 3. Add 19. Is 130. Last column, multiply 130 by 2 and add 37. It is 297. So x equal to 130, y equal to 297. By repeated application of this, you can obtain a obtain a formula, a general integer solution, x equal to this, y equal to this. I don't want to give you only good things. I have to do this because nobody does it. Aryabhata wants own formulas for the volume of a triangular pyramid and the sphere were incorrect. Sorry to tell you because this is blasphemy. But as I said, your inquiry has to be how much they knew, how much they did not know. This way incorrect. Two, that is the, the volume of a sphere was known to Archimedes. Those who claim that Indian mathematicians took results from either Babylonia or Greek mathematicians, I would like to ask them, why then Archimedes' results were not taken? Aryabhata came nearly 700 years later. Why was the logical axiomatic method of the Greeks not taken by the Indians? Why were such a, a lot of things? Why the Indians did not take this? They developed that by themselves. You might have been wrong. The Egyptian rent rind papyrus, which is now in the British Museum, dated around 1650 BC correctly gave the volume of a rectangular pyramid. It is now known that Greeks took a lot of results from Babylonia and Egypt. Brahmagupta. So we now come to the, okay, there are a lot of things. I won't go to this, right? Run out of things, run out of time. This is the indeterminate equation of the second degree, n x square plus c equal to y square. Where n is an integer, and one looks for integer solution for x and y. This is the famous Brahmagupta theorem. Now this was not proved by him or by his disciples. This was proved in two parts, one by B.B. Singh, sorry, B.B. B. B. Dutta and A.M. Singh of Allahabad University, and the other by A.A.K. Iyengar. A.A.K. Iyengar's book <coughs> was published in the Bulletin of Calcutta Mathematical Society. <coughs> so this is the theorem, and the theorem gets its enormous comment. If you know some solution, you can create other solutions. This one, this is known as the marvelous Chakravala method, cyclic method. This was rediscovered in Europe by Euler 11th century after Brahmagupta. A lot of results, Indian results, were rediscovered in Europe by Euler and his friends. Colleagues. This rediscovery business is a, how should I say, is a little dicey. Now, the Peacock book gives a computer program in which, okay, without the computer program, we will not understand the power of the Chakravala method. <coughs> it is accepted the Chakravala method 
anticipated the European method by more than a thousand years. No European performer in the whole field of algebra at a time much later than Bhaskaran may nearly up to our time equal the marvelous complexity of the ingenuity of the Chakravar. Brahmagupta's work in algebra, the high point of Indian mathematics at that time, was more advanced than all Khwarizmi, the Persian mathematician who every elementary algebra textbook says he was the discoverer of algebra. And the term algebra came from its treatise of Zabir work in Kamba. More advanced than our quality in several respects, the notation, admission of negative numbers, and the treatment of Diophantine equation, even though it predated our quality and was, is a very strong statement and was very likely known to him. Why then did Al Khwarizmi's work rather than Brahmagupta become the definitive algebra? It may have been that the time was right for the idea of algebra to be cultivated, and the simple algebra again still is being mischievous, and the simple algebra of Al Khwarizmi <coughs> served this purpose <coughs> better than those of his more sophisticated students. Bhaskar to again, he dealt with, dealt with this in more detail. And in 1657, Marmat proposed a challenging indeterminate equation to another mathematician of the era, Frenico, namely, what, 61 x square plus 1 equal to y square. He challenged Frenicle to solve this equation. Five centuries ago, Bhaskar II had already given its smallest integral solution. So, a lot of Indian results became known to the, to the Europeans. How? Europe at that time were pretty backward in mathematics compared to the Indians. Early notions of differential and integral calculus. For example, he gave delta sine theta and cosine theta delta theta. And when a variable at infinite maxima, the differential vanishes. The surface area of a sphere and the volume were given correctly by a very interesting process by dividing the surface and the volume into a very large number of very small elements and letting the large number go to infinity. So, this was the concept of infinitesimal convenience. Kerala School of Mathematics, 1300 to 1680. So this is also in the the, the the goalposts of time. One side goalpost was Sri Madhava, and other mathematicians. The Kerala mathematicians considered themselves disciples of Aryabhata one, which makes us quite certain. Aryabhata came to, came to, let's say, Patiliputra from Kerala. And he settled in a place called Kusimapura near Patiliputra. All of these people considered themselves intellectual disciples of Aryabhata. Now, let me read out that passionate writing by C.K. Raju. He writes with a lot of passion and anger. Now, when you are a scholar, you can write with passion, but don't be angry. Infinite series expansions are to calculus and analysis, what decimal fractions are to arithmetic. In India, these infinite, infinite series expansions were used by Madhava to derive trigonometric values accurate to third sexagesimal minute and by Nilakantra to develop an accurate planetary model with elective orbits 
by 15 hundred marks. You can check Copernicus is here. It is indeed remarkable. Now he's become sarcastic. It is indeed remarkable that these very trigonometric values, astronomical model, and infinite series first started appearing in Europe in the work of Christoph Clavius, Tycho Brahe, Johannes Kepler, B. Cavalieri, Pierre Farmer, and James Gregory, Newton's student. While Europe was still struggling to become a quantity decimal fraction. <coughs> Incidentally, Tycho Brahe and Kepler were great friends. One of them was on the It is only in the 20th century that the poison mathematician body was extremely pointless. You are not going to get any trace of poison. So that must have been oxidized or decomposed, whatever. But he is absolutely sure one of them was poisoned by his closest friend. Why? The credit. The Indian mind has always had for calculation and the handling of numbers an extraordinary inclination, ease and power, such as <clears throat> no other civilization in history ever possessed to the same degree. So much so that Indian culture regarded the science of numbers, as I mentioned before, as the noblest of its art. A thousand years ahead of European, Indian savants know knew that the zero and infinity are mutually inverse notions. I'll show you an art representing this. Mathematics and classical English. I'll go through quickly. This is the wall painting of Wallace Shire. Kane Mahavati Kane is not far from the wall. Notice this is composed of almost entirely of canvas. It's a beautiful painting. This is Hiranya Garbo of the Golden Jar, signifying the birth of the universe. Universe is an egg, Brahma. Compared with hydrodynamical flow and vertices, and a similarity which might make you laugh, is an, an early single crystal lectures discussed in electron density. Because Shankar talked about my interest in electron density, so I, I couldn't. Uh, this is the temptation of showing electron density <laughs> electron density map for the answers in molecule with the carbon nucleus being at the center of the molecule. This is my favorite, the celebrated Sri Yamsa. Now, this is the pattern. It has 16 plus 8, 24. Wow. I have all the left. Mm. They would like 16 petals represent the feminine element in the universe. Entire. So I won't tell you what are the outer 16 petals. The inner, inner petals, eight petals represent five elements. The other four. Mind, intellect, and egoism. Together, these 24 petals represent the essence of the feminine principle in the entire universe. The four triangles with upper vertices represent the Shiva element. The five triangles with <coughs> downward vertices. Represent what? Shakti. Shakti element. All of you might know that Plato, being a geometry man, represented the fire element with a tetrahedron. No, I don't want to. This is an actual mathematics of the circles and matrices of 
bigger first. As well as if you take an actual lotus in the pond, uh, you take only the lotus calyx, you would see the seeds. I remember in our, in our childhood days, we would steal these lotuses from somebody's pond and then sort of take out the petals and eat the lotus fruits. They're very tasty, by the way. Those who are not done, don't try it now. Okay. You are you are adult. Okay, so this is problem in the seed, not only. Four bungles in classical Indian sculpture, painting and dance. You see, some of hunger, first two pictures. Avanga, one bend. Tivanga, two bend. Otivanga, more than two bend. Now, the first, there are four pictures here. The first picture, top left, is a painting on a sunflower heart. Earlier, 24 Parigana, before India's independence. Now, I showed you some seals, pictures of seals in the Indus Valley civilization, one of which had a picture on the right. You see a, a square divided into four parts, two block, two black and two white. I am convinced now, but this needs much, much more study, I am convinced. My mind. Because the question is, who are we? I'm convinced that we are descendants of the ancient Indian indigenous community. They were the creators of Indus Valley civilization. We talk about Aryan invasion and we being Aryans. Because let me tell you. I have been into this for at least 60 years, six zero. Writing the book took seven years, apart from my other simple researches. So it is not written just like that. 67 years is not a small number. Okay. On the right hand side, top right, you see tribal Indian. Dancing again represented by triangles, etc. <clears throat> now, bottom right, you see a sketch by a sketch of Suri Sindhu in the Konarak painting. How many of you have been to Konarak painting? Young people? So, one of the things I have to do is to move as much as I can to in India. All of India. Not that I have been everywhere in India, but uh, acquiring certain academic notoriety has its advantages. You are asked to take the lectures. Okay, so you can be in many places. And I acquired some notoriety because everywhere I would go, the hosts after the lecture is over, they take me to some temple and so you know that, but you would enjoy the architecture as well. So you can go. So I so a lot of stuff. All that was in your mind. And uh, an extra form I should tell you. Those of you who had heard about Didarganj Yakshi from a place near Patna. Once I was in Aurangabad, again in connection with the and that time in Aurangabad Museum, Didarganj Yakshi was in this place. So, a magnificent statue of Tamil. So, I, I told my colleague, I have to go and see. He said, okay, we'll also go. We went. Right, so, it was on a pedestal. And we need to say, huh? I had done this, but look at the place. I knew Didar and Yakshi as an enigmatic smile. The corner of the lips, you can shake it. <coughs> Forget about Mona Lisa. 
this is the real link matrix model and uh, various people might have interpreted it in different ways one said she's such a beautiful woman she has entered the king's court of Persia. she is smiling without letting it be seen because she knows precisely the effect she is creating on the entire world she doesn't let us mind hmm? all this. So I stood in front, I knew all that. I was trying to find her smile. So I was not there for long when my colleagues came and caught me. The person said, we have to go because otherwise we'll miss our flight. I said, so soon. Said, you were standing in front of this statue for at least an hour. What are you doing? I said, you see, I was trying to, trying to understand what she's trying to tell me. And there is no fact, let's go. So I, I said, I still have not understood. But it was clear to me that she was trying to tell me something. Okay. So Sura Sandari, you see, the, there is a triangular structure in the person which has been seen here. These are not my words, but, but I mean into it. And you see, she was jungle, created by joining two trapezia to their bases. And the, the threads of the jungle, just like a, an animal's torso. So these, these, are, these are interpretations. Now, we'll end with this. This is Durga Mahishashi Mantini from Mamalapura, which is what is called Mahabalipura. Goddess Durga, slayer of the Bhakti. Now, you can see on the, on the left half of this structure, a young Durga. Hmm? She has released an arrow. It's partly broken, and Moishashu with a mace in his hand, Durga assault with her gunners or with her soldiers, was created to the death of Durga, as told in Markandeva Purana. Incidentally, the Mahalaya. Mahalaya chant, very popular Mahalaya chant by Vidyamri Krishna follows Mahatma Purana. I'll take that. So, she is, okay, this is the, this is the indication of the fight. No she is falling behind. So, she is going to lose the battle. Why am I showing this to you? There was a young Swiss architect named Alice Bono, who asked this question concerning structure, stability, and fluctuations. These three together are the main theme of today's statistics. He asked, these statues are more than 1,000 years old. How are they standing? So fluctuations will have to be there, stability questions, structure. So she thought about it. The story goes, she would sit for, from morning to night, she would sit for hours and hours in front of statues. Look at the dedication. And this goes on for months until she says, I'm not. The local, local women and local people began to call her Devi. So she thought, they thought she's a reincarnation of Goddess Durga. Otherwise, how can she? So the result I want to explain, she has a space division for the entire sculpture through overlapping circles and space division has parallel diagonal and she explained the stability 
in detail through this. This is the time division. Here there are two overlapping circles. It cannot be seen clearly on the screen. In contrast to three circles. And here the diagonals are all inclined. We have written a book on this. I have a copy of the book. In fact, there are three or rather two Swiss architects. I respect them tremendously. Here, the insights they gave us, nobody has seen. One is Alice Bonner, the other is Stella Kramlisch. I don't know if you know. Stella Kramlisch was invited to India by Togo. She was a dancer and an architect. She delivered a lecture on Indian culture special lecture at the University of Oxford. She was very young girl. Sadly, not more than 20. And already known for her intellectual powers. Tagore also had a lecture to deliver. Tila Kamrish, we said later, that when I came down from the dais after delivering my lecture, I was enveloped in a bare heart by the towering presence of Rabindranath Tagore. Very soon, she was invited to Santi Nivetan by Tagore. She came in those days, very difficult to go to Santi Nivetan. She said, I did not know this before, but Tagore himself came to receive me at the station. And two dear came with him to receive me. <laughs> so beautiful. Okay, so this is geometry in Ajanta painting. This is known as the Ajanta left hand painting, known as the Salam. Salam on a grid. Salam is one palm. This is structure of Bodhisattva Avalokan Shashara Padma Pan, meaning the Lord who looks down. And has a lotus in his hand. The diagonal is a scene of Buddha speaking. This is what I told you. I will show you both zero and infinity. This is Mula Prakriti, the root of nature or woman. Woman represents both zero and infinity. Note the symbolizing both void and infinity. Note the Sanskrit word for me. I try to reproduce the color in the original painting. Very high power scanner is this scanner. This is one thing. You couldn't do it. The original painting is such, you immediately realize this infinity void immediately will get the message. Most of the great discoveries in nature, I think. I have said enough, would have been the, the great inventions and discoveries of which we are so proud, would have been impossible without a developed system of methods. And this in turn would have been impossible if Europe had been shackled by the unwieldy system of Roman Nimai. The unknown man who devised a new system was from the world's point of view, after the Buddha, the most important son of India. His achievement, although easily taken for granted, was the work of an analytical mind of the first order and it deserves much more honor than we are so positive. Now forget honor, I mean, somebody who is at least as great as Buddha does not need our honor. As an example, consider number 88. This was taken from our October program. It requires three digits in the Indian system, but 12 digits in the Roman system. To write 1 million in the Roman system, one has to write n, 1,000 things. Indeed, no other number system of antiquity comes anywhere near the Indian system in sophistication and useful economy. <clears throat> Thank you for listening so patiently.
let me conclude by saying my object of telling these things to the young people because they are teachers or mentors know most of these things themselves. I wanted to tell you this because if you don't know your country, if you don't know your own culture, which is a Mediterranean culture, then you don't have roots. You are not standing on firm soil. And unless you have roots, unless you stand on firm soil, how are you going to spread your wings? You have to spread your wings. You have to do great things. Thank you. Yes, please. Please feel free to ask questions. Yeah. I cannot see from here. From the... No, no, obviously nobody will see only now. <clears throat> Tupia Santra. <coughs> anyway, from the audience also, from the audience also, young people feel free. You can even tell me that I don't believe any of this. Feel free. So I start with the answer. I'm sure the government is going to get it. Friendship can be done with the government. Except the Canadian, the Canadian government. No, this, this began earlier, the concept. The infinite concept of infinite symbols. So it began earlier. Kerala mathematicians went further. They to derive infinite series of arc, 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 uh, tangent x, or pi. Those who are interested, this derivation by Kerala methods of these two infinite series. I could not find the relations of other infinite series. But R tangent, that is inverse of that, and part these two groups I have. So so they have these concepts. Fourteen. Let's start. Let me tell you. It is now accepted all over Juma. This is accepted all, all over Juma. You see, I am not just telling you what I think. That is not important. What I think. What is established? It's established all over the world. Everybody knows that the foundations of calculus was laid by the <coughs> Kerala math. Mathematicians. They have been studied by French mathematicians, they have been studied by other mathematicians. Everybody agrees. And in fact, my book also like this How did Gregory publish in finance series? Gregory came to know of this from uh, Italian mathematicians. And he was sent from Delhi to Italy to learn mathematics from these mathematicians. How does this two mathematicians know about this? There is a long investigation on this. And the conclusion by Rajiv, C.K. Rajiv, 
as I told you, very angry and passionate book. A huge book with uh, full of circumstantial evidence, but there is no direct evidence. And uh, you, know, you might believe that Newton did, did this. The fact is, Jesuit missionaries, in all probability, Jesuit missionaries who came to Canada exported this to Rome. From Rome, it diffused to other European countries. Rome had an injunction, Catholic Rome. You cannot acknowledge pagan sources. Indians were backward pagans, although we know it is the opposite of what is true. So Newton just said that standing on the shoulders of giants. I asked in my childhood, who is giants? Nobody knew. They're standing on the shoulders of giants. Do you know what the giant? That mathematics in Kerala was at that time the most advanced. No, because these were these were spiritual or intellectual disciples of Aryabhata one. He was a mathematician. It was both a mathematician and astronomer. I have not talked much about astronomy. Yes, Newton, I understand no, you so see, uh, you see, no, calculus, calculus, because you see, are you going to give the concept of the there is a, there is a continuity. And uh, in the olden days, ancient Indian mathematicians said, mathematics was for the purpose. Mathematics must have been done, must be done for the good of society. Jain, Jain mathematicians did not accept it. They said the pleasure of doing mathematics is so great, mathematics should be done for mathematics itself. So, who knows the Kerala mathematicians might have talked about this? Incidentally, let me tell you, we do not know this end of the story. In Indian, whatever area you go to, it's not over. Whatever, for example, that large group you might have, that it is just a drop in the ocean, nothing. Because in, I have talked about 1300 to something. There are two gaps in Kerala mathematics, each gap of 500 years. What happened in this 500 years? We don't know. Madhava, Madhava Karya doesn't come like a strike. It must be something before me. Who, who are before me? Okay? Because the Kerala school, they believe that it was established by Madhava Karya. I don't think so. Madhava Karya, what we know, is the first of the Kerala school. As far as we know from the record. Where did it come from? How did it get there? How do you know this matter? So as I said, India's past needs an enormous amount of scientific inquiry, unbiased, accurate scientific inquiry. Okay. So to me, ask me something. No, no, no. It's just a curiosity. So we know uh, Sridharacharya's formula uh, for solving quadratic equation. Was there any attempt to solve like cubic equation or quadratic equations in India? Yeah, yeah. This will also come in my book. But <coughs> there was no such method for solving cubic and quadratic. What this clever math means you? Cubic equation into a product of a quadratic equation and the linear. Clever. 
but not every cubic equation can be converted like this. And convert a quartic equation as square of a quadratic equation. Again, not every quartic equation can be converted like this. So basically, they are still solving the linear quadratic independent equations. Genuine cubic, which cannot be factored, or genuine quartic equations, which cannot be factored, I do not find them to be. Maybe some other, but let me say, tell you. Nobody can, nobody can claim that my studies are interesting. As I said, whatever you do, Indian culture and civilization is at most a drop in the ocean. Nothing more than that. No, not in, not in the, not in, not only, yes. uh, not only, <laughs> in between are the vast majority of people. So, but you see, let us not be unfair to the two extremes. They might need this knowledge also, because you would frequently see in the, in the newspapers that somebody from the right hand extreme saying something, and in response, somebody from the left hand extreme says something. I was amused to read the numerous such things about. But now there is no left and right. <laughs> not in the parliament. Not in the parliament. Sir, there is one uh, thing that is Arjavata's solution for something like mx plus c is equal to six. Yeah. Six, yeah in your slide mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. you make division division quotient reminder quotient reminder that is the uh, yeah. and the then point. finally you came up with a triangle half triangle who looks like gauss elimination looks like gauss elimination maybe maybe i haven't looked at that I haven't thought. Yeah. if you yeah. see that uh, uh, you know because you are multiplying the earlier number and then you are adding something and then you are getting adding the number uh, looks like the opposite way of doing Gauss elimination. I see. I'll look into it. That is very interesting. Yeah. I haven't thought about it. Yeah. Any other question from students? Uh, side? What about questions from the from the hidden yeah. audience? Yes. Yeah. Uh, from online, please ask your question or you write in the chat box. You must have many questions. So student in the audience. You see, I always say that Indian students are the nicest in the world <laughs> because they never ask any questions to their teachers. No matter how much you tell them, please ask, please ask. <laughs> they are <laughs> no, uh, I know. No, but yes, he has please. taken first year BTEC class okay. in IIT Bombay. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> IIT Bombay would say, I my first year students should say, if they haven't understood, they would say, I have no idea. No, he's not <laughs> they would say, See, you cannot. No so within one minute, if you cannot answer, anchor. <laughs> anchor. Yeah. Uh, uh, very a wonderful lecture. So I was trying to see you. You give examples of these architects. I was trying to draw some cor cor correlations. You know this work by Patrick Geddes. I mean, who was trying to? In fact, he was the first person to write a biography on Jagadish Bose. So I was also trying to see. Th these are the people who were thinking of sustainable cities much before these concepts now have become kind of what? Sustainable, what? sustainable cities, sustainable architecture. Indian cities have not been made on any sustainable thing. For example, now whenever there is rain, you have either water logging or water shortage in uh, Delhi or some, in Madras or somewhere. So I think this, this uh, is it two things Indian city planners have done. Maybe it is almost impossible to do. 
one thing which you said is that they left expansion of cities practically impossible. The second thing is they plan for linear population. Population never grows linear. But if you plan for exponential population growth, what is the money? Where is the money coming? So the first question. So these limitations are there. So sustainable, sustainable growth is something that, uh, incidentally, on my say, why can't you control population? I must tell you, once I looked at UNDP reports for three or four years, <coughs> including India and all countries. You know what my conclusion was. I have not published it anywhere. My conclusion was any country whose population grows at the rate of 2 to 2.5 percent per year is going to be a very strong country. Any country which thinks of achieving zero population growth is going to die in course of time. India is in the 2 to 2.5 percent growth, not many countries are. This should be told to young people. That's right, because China is now having a huge problem of labor. We were thinking of China, in fact, they in the 60s, they implemented this uh, one family, one child program. Now they are having terrible labor problem. Now soon also, they will have to import from India. Yeah, also, you know, this is, is it, I've been told this by Chinese intellectual that they have huge cities, large multi story buildings. No people. Yeah, that's the. the no people. There are seven uh, art forms where you can see uh, beautiful scale invariance behavior. That means uh, the fractal nature, somehow they had some idea when they drew. Yeah. You see, fractality is also inherent in Indian culture. If you read Mahabharata or Sri Vishnu Shakalma's Panche Tantra, what are these? Stories using stories using stories in stories. Amazing. And no other country did this. Peculiar kind of storytelling. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That. Yes. Please, please, please. please. Thank you very much, sir, for such a beautiful talk. First of all. So uh, I have always been very intrigued by. Close to your mouth. Am I audible? Or if necessary, come. Come to the front, huh? Huh? Take the take the middle road, huh? That is safer. Why are you going to write it? Please tell me. First of all, sir, thank you very much for such a beautiful talk. Uh, Actually, I'm. I'm very. I have always been very intrigued by, by the Indian culture mythology, uh, but then more often than not, we we know we we hear about other culture, like other famous culture, other other people mm, like like yourself shown, the Archimedes, other mathematics mathematician from uh, outside India. So I would just like to know your thought as to what went wrong. Uh, that our people could not disseminate their knowledge uh, to entire world. Like, how come we know from them, uh, but then our our culture was that rich? First of all, you see, the decay in Indian civilization began from around. If you look at Sanskrit, decay of Sanskrit, they are about 12 centuries. Look at the English. So it is like when a power collapses in full bloom, 
natural proteins are to be either and die. This happens plus from 1300 onwards, foreign cultures came to India. And particularly during the British rule, practically everything in India was suppressed. <coughs> Indian education system was a very, very nice education system. Now, leave us, leave everybody know, but what I'm going to tell you, you may not know. Take Bengal. Take Bengal. Bengal had 80,000 rural schools. You know, talking stores, transfer stores, we used to call them. 80,000. Of course, Bengal was undivided. Okay. What was taught in this school? Three subjects. Sanskrit, logic, mathematics. Everybody has to know. Every student. When Persians came here, and there, they were very surprised at these three subjects from here. Now, the British had studied India thoroughly before venturing into India. Lord Dalhousie <coughs> Ranji to tell us about Lord Dalhousie. Both Romans, I found historically, both Romans and the British would study a country very, very carefully before trying to conquer. So the British, one of the conclusions was Indians are very happy all the way. Happy with what they have. Second, their education system is very good. They, are, they know logic very well and they, they argue easily. You cannot convince, convince them easily. Okay. So he gave his monarch a prescription. Therefore, Indian education system was totally destroyed. Till the first requirement when you have to subjugate the people, subjugate culture, destroy. This has been done all the time. But the British is quite clever. Before destruction, they took the best from the Indian system. I don't know all the things they took. Two things I can tell you, they took the three subjects from India which is still being followed in India, but it is being copied from the British. Second thing they took, you see, this is something I have written out before, but I did not know that in Bengal it was done. That in every class, Putin and Yenji, you know, there was a Sardar photo, namely class monitor. Now this class monitor used to be the best student in the class. So the teacher would choose a few students who are the toppers in the class. He would ask the topper to teach the other students. There is no better system. This is the British system. <laughs> so this, there, there must have been others. So they did not destroy it, completely destroy it, but they took the best from the what they can do. So incidentally, it is not that others did not know that India was great. I have told you only a few, a few quotations. If you take a look at my book, every chapter has a number of quotations from Syria, from Greece, from everywhere. Syria, eight, eight hundred, eight centuries. And those things that Indians are particularly good in mathematics. Greeks are not that good, except geography. Even now, you if you go to USA as in India, they would be amazed. Even now, how can you do arithmetic, etc., so fast mentally? What no, happened? Without, 
you know you know there is this cartoonist bilba i really like his cartoon so bilba was published the cartoon so you know two friends uh, sitting at so the table having tea so one friend says oh my tea has gone cold so what is saying that to take the cup the full cup let's say the against this drop and after some time the tea has become hot so jabba to this guy is a former graduate of an iit from <laughs> <laughs> so is not that it, i said that india was known as the land of knowledge wisdom everybody came to india to learn knowledge to learn philosophy and they went back and said i have done so they stole essentially let me be blunt and then any occupying force who destroy the indigenous culture in order to have the full on the full control now some british people have asked me but why are you denying the good things the british did railway the railway did that i said no they are these are very good but why the british did railway for their their purpose but this was very good So let me regarding railway etc. I don't know whether you have read the book, the Great Art, the Great Art, E R C. This was how India was mapped by Sudan, and the culmination of this effort. Many people had died. Many Indians, British officers had died from the southernmost tip to the northernmost point. The northernmost point was what Mount Everest. Now, so number of people who were involved, British officer who died, other people came, Indian workers had died. Now, finally, it came to Everest. I am pronouncing it correctly. His name is not Everest. Everest. Okay. So it came to Everest. and then uh, this data was there and he could not make head or tail of it so that fellow arnab sigar used it calculated the height of a peak the peak had a number that peak with that number and said is this one and he went to ibrest now ibrest did not name the peak after him no this was other british officers they called it mount everest mount everest is a good name because the mountain is ever at rest it's a good name ibrest did not like this name and there was nothing he could so to be fair to him he did not name it after him so if you read this book the great art i think i feel like this is art it's a beautiful Beautiful, not large, but beautiful. So, have I answered your question? Mughal rule, Persian rule, yes. So they did not completely destroy. For example, in Bengal, the Bengalis are very adaptable, highly adaptable. Bengalis were learning Sanskrit; they also learn Persian. The same scholar was. Adapt to Sanskrit and in Persian. Persian was necessary to get government jobs. You know? Bengalis were so obsessed, followed even today with government. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah. So it's a long lecture. So Professor Dev must be very tired and yeah, not I'm not tired. Yeah. <laughs> so don't <laughs> don't tease me. I once <laughs> gave a three-hour lecture in Japan. We completely forgot about time. And nobody expects any business. This was an insider. And uh, I was so, so embarrassed. How deep time goes? Yeah. So, uh, uh, Professor Tapu, can you tell something? Well, uh, you must agree with me. I mean, what I told that you will be enthralled by the speaker at many such occasions previously also. So let us thank Professor Dave for an excellent evening lecture. And I hope we'll, be, we'll have occasions in future to hear more from him. Thank you, Professor Dave. I'm going to tell.